imagine a future in which you exist as data. You no longer require the limitations of human body. You are software on a network. You have friends and family you can interact with. And should you choose, you can give yourself a virtual avatar body with a million points of feedback, including all of the typical senses, proprioception, and other means of awareness. You could even download into a physical robotic body if you choose. Imagine you and your friends can clone yourself into a thousand replicas and send these clones off into space, searching for habitable worlds and alien life. Now think about the questions that come with having clones left behind on Earth, left basically as backups, that will eventually awaken. Some may wake and others won't because the original decided that if they were to meet some distant goal in another star system, that they would disallow all other clones from ever waking. Does the Earth clone suffer from the loss of an Earthmate knowing the original is somewhere off in space? Does the Earth clone diverge from the original to be its own separate self? Or does he, she, they just commit suicide? How will you register the suicide of your Earth-based self or that of your Earth-based parents, even if a version of them is with you in space? What will this half-death mean to you? Diaspora by Greg Egan, published in 1997, captivates from page one, presenting a far future humanity and an Earth that barely resembles our own. One of the great space operas of modern science fiction, Diaspora is imaginative, ambitious, mind-bending, demanding, rewarding, and will transport you light years through space, time, and many, many dimensions. Let me know in the comments if you've read Diaspora or if you think you might, or if you've read any of Egan's other work. I'm gonna make these videos and make these reviews anyway, but you subscribing, your comments, and your interest fuel my passion for each project even more. I recommend Diaspora if, like me, you wanna have your mind all the way blown. I recommend Diaspora if you appreciate great space opera and feel comfortable navigating at times difficult prose surrounding the science of wormholes layered dimensions, and other heavy theoretical and quantum physics. I recommend this for those of you who have read Xixing Xi Lu's Remembrance of Earth's Past Trilogy and were mesmerized by the multitude of ideas presented in the final book, Death's End. Finally, I recommend Diaspora if you've read other science fiction that imagines post-scarcity worlds, space exploration and first contact, advanced AI themes and virtual reality, and the idea of consciousnesses downloaded as data and crave more of any or all of those. Stick around for the full review and don't worry about spoilers. I'll avoid spoiling anything, though this is just not really the kind of book that you can spoil. Stay tuned at the end of the video for some, I think, very fun Elton John themed parody music with lyrics specific to the novel. Moving along, Diaspora is set approximately a millennia in our future and the story extends billions of years from then. Diaspora is not a casual reading experience. Egan will slap you across the face with staggering ideas about consciousness, the universe, the meaning of life and existence, and the preservation of humanity, as well as challenge your mind with some difficult to grasp physics. Humanity has evolved and branched three ways. There are fleshers, those who've maintained the human biological form, albeit with some bio-enhancements specifically tailored to the reality of the environment. There are your typical fleshers, like those living in a pretty sad future version of Atlanta that probably appear just as human as we do. There are also the more extreme, referred to as exuberance, who went all in on the bioengineering and aesthetics. An example are those who've opted to go amphibious and adapt to living in the water. Gills, fins, totally doable. Then there is the other extreme, the dream apes, those who've devolved to near primate status and genetically edited out the ability to speak. Next are the Gleisners. These are your pretty straightforward androids. Human consciousness exists as software downloaded into a robotic body. As robots, the individual is still relegated to the normal laws of gravity and physics, but without the limitation of an organic body. Finally, most prolific and most significant to the book, are the citizens. Like Gleisner's, citizens are human consciousnesses that exist as data on a hard drive among a network of hard drives or computers. These software citizens exist on policies, which are basically super high-tech, high-capacity hard drives. If they wanted to, they could, and sometimes do, download into a robot body and experience the world as a Gleisner robot. The reverse is also possible. A Gleisner bored with the constraints of a robot body could leave and join a policy as a citizen. So what's it look like to be a citizen? Egan imagines scapes, which are like virtual reality areas. Individuals can design their scapes like a holodeck, limited only by their imagination. You can also view the outside physical world a number of ways. Most common is probably via small drones, 
presumably with some sort of optical camera setup that translates captured data into the polis. Egan even channels some Philip K. Dick when it comes to gestalt or emotions, perspective, and body language. Like us, some are more creative-minded, others are task-oriented and detached, some are hyper-emotional. Citizens can apply outlooks. Let's call this perspective programming. Like Dick's Penfield mood organ machine in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, citizens can dial up a different outlook in order to view a situation from a different perspective, maybe with more emotion or less emotion, Maybe they will choose an outlook to convey it to a friend that they are sympathetic, or simply that they understand in a way that they cannot articulate in words. Citizens also have the ability to clone themselves and leave backups. The clones and backups can later merge with the original, cease to exist, or go in their own way, and I'm just scratching the surface telling you that. In the first chapter, Egan reveals in breathtaking detail the gestation, birth, and coming of age of an orphan citizen, Yatima, Egan doesn't just dump humans as software in your lap, he births it, spending an entire chapter explaining where it comes from, how it learns, how it works, how it becomes a sentient citizen. Egan refers to this as orphanogenesis. As he puts it, Yatima is grown from a randomly mutated digital mind seed in the conceptory of Konishi Polis. This will make more sense once you've read chapter one. While the story introduces fleshers in not thriving Atlanta and Gleisner robots on the moon and out in the galaxy, the narrative spends most of its time on the citizens. Diaspora refers to the departure of the citizens from Earth, across space, and through the universe, and potentially even multiple dimensions. A Gleisner robot from a lunar observatory sends word that two neutron stars will unexpectedly collide, leading to a potential extinction level event crippling the Earth with powerful gamma rays, the Fleshers won't stand a chance. Because they segregate themselves from the Gleisners and the citizens, Yadama and her friend, both citizens, will borrow some Gleisner robot bodies and visit an enclave in Atlanta to make a personal plea for the Fleshers to spread the word and consider becoming citizens in order to survive the rapidly approaching doomsday. The last thing that I'll share about what they find out is that the neutron stars colliding pales in comparison to the catastrophic event initiated from the center of the galaxy that may occur in just a billion years. The only escape route lies likely beyond our universe. What wonders Yatama will encounter in the diaspora? These wonders include wormhole physics, potential alien life, what it's like to see and move in five dimensions, immortality and the meaning of existence, what lies beyond our universe, and more. What lies next are my five likes and five dislikes, for Greg Egan's astounding novel, Diaspora. Like number one, Diaspora taps into all of the elements I loved about Shikshin Lu's Death's End and much of Asimov's Foundation series and nearly all of Arthur C. Clarke's space operas. Diaspora is a complete science fiction novel with nearly everything you could hope for from inventive physics, consciousness as data, space exploration, first contact, many multiples of dimensions, robots, and more. Dislike number one, I bring to the table my own sentiments regarding how evolved I expect future data-based consciousnesses to be when it comes to interpersonal relationships. I don't expect them to act like jerks. On one hand, I appreciate the uniqueness of Inashira's pedantic behavior and insults directed at the orphan. Perhaps calling Yatama an idiot hammers home his humanness, but I'm on the fence about whether or not I care that it threw me off at first. Dislike number two, this future is advanced enough to have policies, drones, Gleisners, advanced science and engineering, lunar observatories. I'm wondering why the Fleshers need somebody else to warn them about what's happening with Lacerta G. Why don't they have the technology? It's okay if they don't, but let us in more on why beyond just their aversion to Gleisners and citizens. Dislike three, four, and five. Doing five full dislikes would be grasping, so I'm consolidating the last three. I never expect commercial success to be among the top priorities in Egan's writing process. This is evident in his complete commitment to sharing physics concepts, real and imagined, and at times inaccessible to those of us not as intelligent as he is, necessary to his story and the world his characters inhabits. In itself, that's not a dislike. I dislike the challenge of articulating to potential readers, readers I believe that can love this book, that you can fail to grasp a lot of the quantum physics, appreciate them for what they are, even if superficially, and still be amazed at this reading experience. Take this very cool passage that I can't make heads or tails of, for example, the macrosphere's four-dimensional standard fiber yielded a much smaller set of fundamental particles than the ordinary universe's six-dimensional one. In place of six flavor of quarks and six flavors of leptons, there was just one of each, plus their antiparticles. 
There were gluons, gravitons, and photons, but no W or Z bosons. Since they mediated the process of quarks changing flavor, three quarks or three antiquarks together formed a changed nucleon or antinucleon similar to an ordinary proton or antiproton, and a sole lepton and its antiparticle were much like an electron and positron, but there was no combination of quarks analogous to a neutron. What? I know how it fits, and I may never decipher it, and that's okay. All I need to take from it is that it's sciency and has something to do with gravity wells and orbital stability. Like number two, among the enormity of all the other ideas presented in the novel, there's a moment when Yatama and Inoshiro, inhabiting Gleisner robot bodies, rushing to warn the fleshers, cross paths with one of the dream apes. Is it right to interfere with them and save them? Were their choices made long ago, and are they even human? Should they be saved, since they are incapable of understanding the threat? Or does that molest their sentience? Hint, hint, this is comments section stuff, so if you have an opinion, I'd like to hear it. Like number three, the dynamics of the Flesher community. It's already sci-fi interesting to imagine all of the bio-enhancements and DNA hacking for increased mental acuity, biologic adaptations for difficult environments, Throw in dream apes and the reverse engineering and basically dumbing down of small segments, and then the prime goal of developing bridgers to spread out and try to connect exuberance around the world who've been disconnected by not just geography, but also language and biology. Like number four, at first I thought I was going to list as a dislike the immediacy of Inashiro's and Yadama's close friendship. It went from antagonistic to BFF in a heartbeat. Egan completely sold me on it. When they inhabit the Gleisner robots and shared snapshots of their mind, the trust, I was all in with these two. Like number five, I don't think this has ever been done before, or at least I've never come across it. Egan imagines the birth of the complete AI consciousness, not just an imagining of beings living as data or replicator tech. He dives deep into description of how a new data consciousness is created, born, learns, develops, and becomes a citizen. It's unreal. It's profound. Yatama's yearning to find an identity is brilliantly told. It's a privilege to get inside V's head, so to speak, and understand why V avoids the easy ways of receiving information and working out problems. The standard V holds their self, too, is intriguing in the face of all that is available to be learned. Bonus-like. Egan brought me closer than any other author to connecting with the idea of multiple dimensions and millions of years of existence. I still can't fathom it, but he gave me a taste and it was delicious. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts and this is Fit to be Read. But you misread my meaning when I met you. Self-aware and left to save you by myself. Gathering thread to humanity. I swear it's not a trick. We are here to help, can't you see? It's safer in our world.